Hello and welcome to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. Just before we get into the video, guys, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you. We're just about to hit 300 subscribers, and I am absolutely blown away by the huge amount of support that the channel has received, both from the students at my university, as well as students from abroad. I really didn't think in my wildest dreams that we we're going to hit such a big milestone so quickly. Um, and honestly, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to see where we have gotten so far. In the meantime, please, please do reach out and let me know if there's any video topics you guys want covered, any things that don't make sense, you know, drop a comment down below or even reach out to me on Instagram. I'm usually active on one of the two and I will see it. Um, I've just got exams coming up at the moment, but I will be working on videos throughout summer. So please do reach out and let me know what you guys want to see and where we can take this channel ahead. With that said, let's get into our first case. We have a 27-year-old female who presented to the GP due to the appearance of a strange rash over the back of her legs, following the bout of an upper respiratory tract illness. On further history, she tells you that she has had some nosebleeds. However, she did not think it was worth bothering the doctor over. She has a previous history of appendectomies with no uh, other complications. On examination, you notice a purpuric rash over the back of her legs. A blood film which was carried out shows no red cell fragments and no platelet clumps. And her full blood count showed this. Please feel free to pause the video now and have a go at what you think the answer is. Okay, so the answer here is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So what in the history and the investigations points to the diagnosis of ITP? Well, here I've highlighted in red the things that points to the diagnosis of ITP. So let's start with the fact that she is a 27-year-old female. Now, we know from the fact that she's a female, this, is, uh, this cannot be haemophilia A because we know haemophilia A is an X-linked uh, recessive condition. So we can uh, immediately rule this out as this would be seen in males. Then we go into this idea of a rash appearing following the bout of an upper respiratory tract illness. Now, remember, ITP often follows the um, often follows and comes on after an upper respiratory tract illness and may come as a purpuric or petechial rash. OK, um, we move on to find out that she's got purpura in the back of her legs and that she's having nosebleeds. Now, these again point to the diagnosis of a primary hemostatic disorder, something wrong with either the platelets or von Willebrand's factor. Now, the ones now from this point of view, we can already see that ITP is significantly more likely. So why is it not something like a disseminated intravascular coagulation on TTP? Well, TTP presents, remember, in that five classical pentad that we've discussed, and we don't see any parts of the pentad uh, occurring in this. DIC uh, is when we have a formation of uncontrolled clots all over our body. And as a result of this, we would expect to see uh, some degree of anemia, but her hemoglobin is normal. As well as this, um, we might expect to see uh, red cell fragments and platelet clumps, which we can't see on the uh, blood film. So therefore, again, this rules out disseminated intravascular coagulation. And lastly, with the uh, pattern of bleeding added to the fact that she's got an isolated thrombocytopenia and her uh, white cell count and her hemoglobin is completely normal, it makes ITP more likely over acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which would be seen more in younger people. Although it's not impossible to see them uh, in 27-year-old uh, uh, adults, it's more commonly seen in children. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question, we have a four-year-old girl who's brought into the GP by her mother due to lacking energy. She states that her daughter has experienced three episodes of diarrhea and a high fever over the last three days with an episode of bloody diarrhea in the last 24 hours following her visit to her friend's birthday party. On examination, you notice slight scleral icterus as well as conjunctival pallor. Her full blood count is shown below. Given the likely diagnosis, what are you most likely to see on a blood film? So again, feel free to pause the video now and have a go at this question. The answer here is actually schistocytes, or we may see a schistocytosis. So how do we get to this answer? Well, we understand from the reading this is that this person has lacking energy. Now, there's lots of causes of lacking energy, but here we have to keep in the back of our mind that could this be uh, some kind of an anemia, which we go later on to confirm in the full blood count. She states that her daughter has, an ep uh, has had episodes of diarrhea, which has recently turned bloody. And as well as this, 
we also see slight scleral icterus and conjunctival pallor. And on the full blood count, what we can see is we have an anemia and a thrombocytopenia. So when we start to put all the puzzles together, what do we see? Well, we have um, anemia, we have thrombocytopenia, and we have an episode of bloody diarrhea with diarrhea uh, going on before it. So all of this points to the diagnosis of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which comes on uh, due to the infection of E. coli 0157H7 species. And this would also be in keeping with the fact that she has recently gone to her friend's birthday party where she may have been uh, infected. So why, may we, why is it schistocytes and not any of the other things? Well, remember in any type of uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which HUS is, we get the formation of schistocytes or fragmented red cells as they get sheared by the clumps of fibrin um, and platelets. Heinz bodies are often seen in G6PD deficiency, which are not associated um, with uh, bloody diarrhea. In fact, there's usually in a, in a question, there's a history of them having something like uh, exposure to fava beans or nitrofuron toin, which this uh, child clearly does not. Spherocyte, spherocytes and elepcocytes often come in the two conditions, hereditary spherocytosis and hereditary epilo, uh, elliptocytosis, respectively. And again, you would not expect these uh, to have an association with bloody diarrhea, nor should the platelet count be low. And lastly, target cells are again, not something that we would uh, see in hemolytic uremic syndrome, but you may see in things like iron deficiency anemia, um, and as well as that you might see in thalassemia uh, as well. In this question, we're looking at hemolytic uremic syndrome. The next question, we have a 65-year-old lady who was uh, admitted to the respiratory ward, uh, is found to be tired, very lethargic and drowsy. She was admitted yesterday with pneumonia. On arrival, you see the patient is bleeding from her cannulation site. She's reportedly also started bleeding spontaneously from her ears. On examination, she has a temperature of 38.2 degrees, a pulse of eight, uh, 118 beats per minute and a blood pressure of 89 over 60. After stabilizing the patient, you order some clotting studies. Given her underlying diagnosis, what are you likely to see? So pause the video again and have a go at this question. So the answer here is actually thrombocytopenia, prolonged PT and prolonged APTT. Now, why is it not any of the other options? Well, firstly, what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis here is very likely to be disseminated intravascular coagulation. Remember, where we have the formation of lots and lots of uncontrolled clots all over our body. In this condition, we use up all of our platelets. Thus, we see a uh, thrombocytopenia and we use up both our intrinsic and extrinsic pathway clotting factors. Therefore, we see a prolonged PT and a prolonged APTT. A thrombocytosis would certainly uh, most likely not be seen in something like DIC as we are using up the platelets. So therefore, we shouldn't have more platelets. Normal platelets, normal PT and normal APTT is a completely normal picture. And we can see that this patient is clearly not in a normal state. They are bleeding quite significantly. Thrombocytopenia, normal PT and normal APTT might be something that we see in a um, uh, idiopathic or immune thrombocytopenia. However, this is not something that we see in a DIC. And lastly, normal platelets, normal PT and prolonged APTT is a picture that we might see in th something like von Willebrand's disease where we get a raised APTT due to a shuttling factor rate around the body. So next up, we have a 25 year old pregnant lady who was admitted due to reduced consciousness. On examination, you notice that she appears to be confused and disoriented and has a purpuric rash. On, ex uh, on examination, she also has a fever of 38 degrees, is found to have scleral ictris and conjunct subconjunctival pallor. Bedside urine dipstick showed hemoglobin urea. Her use and ease showed a raised creatinine and urea, and her full blood count is shown below. Again, please pause, uh, pause the video and uh, state what may be the underlying uh, mechanism of the disease here. So the most likely uh, answer here is uh, reduce uh, dysfunction of the ADAMS13 uh, enzyme. So how did we get to this answer? Well, let's again break down the history and see what we have. Well, we have a 25-year-old lady with reduced consciousness who was 
confused and disoriented, okay? Um, as well as that, she has a fever of 38 degrees, scleral icterus and subconjunctival pallor, hemoglobinuria, and raised urea and creatinine. And on blood count, we see she has a anemia and a thrombocytopenia. Now, that's a lot of information, so let's uh, break it down into what the most likely diagnosis here is. Well, the most likely diagnosis here is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So how did we get to that? Well, remember, thrombotic thrombocytopenia has a pentad of symptoms. So let's start with the first one. Here you can see that she has reduced consciousness and she's disoriented um, and has a purpuric rash. So we already tick off the neurological soliloquy of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. The next thing we have is a fever, which is another domain of TTP. The next thing we have is an anemia. And we can see that on her uh, full blood count that she's anemic. The next thing we have is a thrombocytopenia due to the platelets being used up, forming lots and lots of clots. The next thing we have is renal dysfunction. And we can see this due to the presence of hemoglobinuria, but mainly the raised urea and creatinine. Now, because we have ticked off each of these uh, five categories, this makes it more likely to be TTP which is characterized by the dysfunction of the Adams-13 enzyme. Next up, we have a 30-year-old lady who presents to the GP due to having bled excessive, uh, sorry, 30-year-old man who presents to the GP uh, due to having bled excessively after his dental extraction. He says that his mother had a tendency to bleed as well. On examination, uh, an examination and otherwise normal. He was investigated with a full blood count, which again appeared to be completely normal. And clotting studies shows a uh, prolonged, isolated APTT. So what is the most likely underlying diagnosis? So please, again, feel free to pause the video. And have a go at this question. So the most likely underlying diagnosis here is von Willebrand disease. So how did we get to this answer? And again, what points in the history towards this? So we have someone who is bleeding excessively after a dental extraction. Okay, so we already know this is a bleeding disorder, and it's likely something uh, to be a, a disorder of primary hemostasis, as he may be having issues with stabilization of the clot. He says that his mother had a tendency to bleed as well. Okay, so we can say that this is, again, if, if there is a genetic link, this won't be hemophilia A, as one, he's presenting quite late for hemophilia A, this usually presents very early on. And two, his mother should certainly not be showing any symptoms um, as it's an X-linked recessive condition. An examination is otherwise normal, but what's interesting is that um, the full blood count again appears to be normal. If we had something like ITP or TTP, we would expect to see a thrombocytopenia. So we can rule these two things out. Um, and then when we go on, what we find out is that he has a prolonged APTT. Now, this occurs if we're missing the von Willebrand's factor, we're not able to shuttle around our factor eight around the body. So the fact that he has a prolonged APTT with a completely normal full blood count, full blood count makes von Willebrand disease the most likely answer. In acute thrombocytopenic, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you might expect this classically in younger children, although it's possible to get it in this age group. But the biggest giveaway here is the fact that he has a prolonged APTT. Lastly, we have a two-year-old boy who's brought into A&E following a fall. He's brought in by his mum due to him being unable to walk uh, following the fall. On examination, his knee appears tense and swollen. His full blood count is normal, however, his clotting study showed a prolonged APTT. Which of the following mechanisms is, most likely, uh, is the most likely mechanism behind the underlying diagnosis? Please again feel free to pause the video and have a go at this question. So the answer here is X-linked recessive. So why is this the answer? Well, again, let's break down the history. So we have a two-year-old boy who's presented following a fall. Now, around about um, by 18 months uh, to 15 to 18 months, children are usually learning to walk or having learned just how to walk. And they may be quite clumsy. They may bump into things, meaning that they might actually be injured and bleed into a joint if they have this condition, which is hemophilia A. He's brought in with, by the mum uh, because he's unable to walk following the fall. So this makes us quite concerned. On an examination, we find that his knee joint appears to be tense and swollen. Now, this idea of a tense, swollen joint suggests there's something else in the joint. And in this case, it's most likely to be blood. His um, 
uh, his full blood count is completely normal. So again, we can say that this is unlikely to be anything to do with the platelets, as we would have picked this up um, on uh, the on the uh, full blood count. However, his uh, plotting study showed a prolonged APTT. Now, the hallmark of uh, hemophilia A is a prolonged APTT due to the uh, missing factor eight or uh, impaired factor eight, which takes part in the um, takes part uh, in the intrinsic pathway of the clotting cascade. And we know that hemophilia A is actually X-linked recessive, so therefore the answer here is X-linked recessive. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next